Welcome back everyone to Box Markets. My name is Paul Hill. I'm delighted today to host a Christmas stock picking forum with two of the UK's finest small cap investors, uh, namely uh, David Thornton of um, Growth Company Investor and Jack Brumby from um, Stockopedia. So welcome, gents. Hey. Hey, Paul. Now, David, just kick it off with yourself. Um, what's your sort of take on um, Omnicrom and how that might play out in the um, the small cap arena over the next few months? It seems to be causing quite a bit of angst. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I always try and be, you know, be optimistic, but, you know, equally you've got to be realistic. Uh, so, I mean, the optimistic take is, that you know, from, from what we can see so far, this looks like... Uh, the sort of progression that a virus tends to make, it becomes uh, less dangerous, um, you know, because if you if you continually kill your host, then, uh, you know, you tend not to last very long as a virus. So you, you tend to mutate. And it, it just seems to be how, how, you know, pandemics in the past have always sort of worked. They, they, they get weaker and weaker and then, you know, peter out. So the optimist in me, and to an extent the realist, uh, is, is rather sort of, um, you know, uh, thinking along those lines. Having said that, you know, uh, being a realist, you've got to sort of figure out what the policy response is going to be. Um, I'm not wholly encouraged by what we've seen so far. Um, you know, having got to a situation where we seem to be, you know, accommodating the, um, uh, you know, the pandemic, we, we now seem to be, you know, back into knee-jerk reactions and slight panic mode. But I think stock markets as a whole have been reasonably relaxed about it. And uh, I, I hope they're right in that. I, my, my, my sense is I, I certainly don't feel inclined to start dumping stock uh, on the back of uh, Omicron. I think there are other reasons to be uh, a bit a bit yeah. wary looking out 12, 18 months. Yeah. Um, well, but, before uh, we move Omicron, on to that, before, before we move on to that, what, you, have you changed your portfolio at all, Jack? Have you sort of like done any change or are you sort of like pretty much um, sanguine about the uh, Omicron? Relatively sanguine. Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. I, I think I've, I've done some slight shuffling and repositioning around supply chain issues and things like that. The only other big change I've done is, is free up a bit more cash just for the optionality for top ups, you know, seeing through uh, the, the present sort of disruption. Mm. What about you, David, in terms of a bit further out then? If we let, let's, let's assume we're right, if we're all sort of right that. OK, it's going to cause a bit of short term volatility, maybe a few options, give, give us a bit of you know, opportunities to sort of buy a few, be a few stocks. If you look sort of like after spring and hopefully we're through this uh, Omicron variant, how do you see equities towards the sort of like, you know, over the next 12 months more broadly? Well, um, well, first of all, on the, just the general economic background, I said I'm, I'm relatively sanguine, you know, on the uh, on, on Chrome. And I think there's plenty of reasons to, to think the UK economy, you know, should do pretty well next year, um, you know, in terms of just in terms of what, you know, the, the health of the consumer, you know, full, full employment, still low interest rates, pent up savings, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I mean, lots of reasons why the, the economic background should should remain reasonably positive. Um, I'll quickly touch on supply chain. When I talk to uh, doing growth company investor, I talk to a lot of companies. I mean, that's very much my sort of process in it. I interview a lot of companies and I don't think the supply chain issues are going to go away from what I'm hearing, you know, for quite some time. So I think that's something that's going to be with us. But companies in the main, you know, are working with that. Well, that'll you impact if, that, if, that, if you're right on that, that'll keep it ele inflation elevated, presumably. Well, that's what I was going to go on to, and that's my big fear. Um, and, and part of it, you know, part of it is, is, you know, if you grew up here in the 1970s, you know, doing economics A-levels and stuff like that, you know, you remember, you know, whatever it was, 20, 24% retail yeah. price inflation in 1976 and so on. I did a piece in, did a piece in GCI um, two or three months ago on inflation. And I, what, what, what I got out of that was that actually the UK's his, long history – uh, in the, that, that experience in the seventies, and there was a, a, an echo towards the end of the eighties, was, was actually unusual. I mean, the UK's inflation experience has been worse than the states, for example. But that period of, of really high emerging markets type levels of inflation is unusual. So I think somebody from my background, it can be quite easy to be really spooked by the inflation threat, you know, of it running away from us. Now, having said that, um, clearly we're in a very weird position at the moment, where ten-year gilts yield less than one percent. Um, you know, inflation, I think, is going to be elevated for quite some time. 
Um, you know, I, I spoke to a company this morning uh, in the tech world and they're struggling with recruitment of qualified people, you know, wage rates being bid up in that area. So, um, you know, skilled employment is tight. Um, yeah, and I think I think the supply chain issues from like, everything I hear from talking to companies, they're not expecting them to end. Uh, you know, hopefully in 12 months time, they'll start, they'll, they'll start to ease. Um, so I think things are going to stay tight. And I think there's a big inflation issue. Central banks are clearly way behind the curve curve here. And um, the, the, you know, getting out of this corner we've painted ourselves into is going to be very difficult. So I do see a, uh, a monetary policy and interest rate shock at some point as we, as, 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 as we adjust. And that could be quite nasty for, would be horrific for bonds. Um, but but not not great for, not great for equities, um, and that's kind of informing how I'm thinking about the you know how I'm thinking about stock, stock selections, what themes what, I want to I want to, I want to play. Yeah. What about you, Jack? How are you sort of like you in equities or small caps in particular? That sort of sweet spot going forward, apart from the Omnigrom. I think the inflation risk is very much there and, and it looks like you know that cycle is going to complete where it gets locked in via higher wages and then people spend more and and this and that uh, i to be honest I, I just focus on companies i view as high quality with strong business models and you know they're very cash generative typically have high margins and just have you know they, they have those layers to them to navigate just robust businesses, um, mm. uh, you with know, pricing that, power. Yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. With pricing power, things I, you know, we'll, we'll go on to a couple of companies in a second, I'm sure. But yeah, yeah, yeah. things that can can pass prices on. Yeah, well, I must admit, I, I'm sort of like relatively upbeat as well in terms of. I actually think there's quite a lot of opportunity. <laughs> I think it's been quite a rotation in the market. Mm. You've got these mega caps sort of like dominant tech players, which has absorbed a lot of the. Uh, of, of people's money and attention. And there's a lot of stocks actually falling the baby out of the bathwater in the small cap space. And we'll start with one which you both like. And uh, if you could take us through this one, uh, uh, David, the property franchise group, it's done tremendously well. And uh, obviously, you know, it's still very cheap. It's, I'll just look into the numbers. It's still less than sort of 12 times PE for next year. So there's money to be made there, I guess. What's your, what's your view on the property group, David? Yeah, Sorry. I mean, um, I uh, I could easily have put Belvoir as, as, as well, but I think Belvoir seems to have a slightly higher profile. I mean, I spoke yeah. I speak to both companies regularly, um, and uh, they, they've both done done very well. And they've they've had a they've it's had a franchiser, little... isn't it, of estate agents? Yes, doing about fifty percent lettings and fifty percent sales yeah. instructions. That's 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 right. I mean the um, I mean the, the the sales instructions has increased. The, the, the recent acquisitions they've done have increased their exposure to sales, which brings in more cyclicality. But in the short term, obviously, it's 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 highly profitable. So that's that's a good thing. The lettings book is is effectively sort of just a very high quality annuity. Um, you know, rents rents get collected. People don't want to lose their homes, so they pay their pay their rents, and those are those are collected or managed. The properties are managed on behalf of landlords by. Uh, by a property franchise group. Um, the model is also high quality because as the name suggests, uh, the majority of, of branches are, are franchised. So they, while they do obviously share some of the pain you know, during a downturn, uh, they are very much insulated from uh, uh, the, much more so than you would be if you were actually owning the, um, the, the, the branches. Uh, so that's a very attractive part of it. What I like about this one as well, uh, you know, when we're comparing them with Belvoir, they're both on very similar sort of ratings. Um, I think I think TPFG are a little bit further behind Belvoir in developing financial services revenues. Um, they just really get starting to grip to that now, uh, whereas Belvoir, I think, last two or three years, they've, they've been making a big push into that area. You know, and you've got a warm client base there, which you're under exploiting by not selling them financial services, which you, you need when you when you're moving house or you know taking out a mortgage and so on. Um, and the other thing, a little bit of a hidden value, is that the you move uh, digital hybrid agency, uh, which is again done on a sort of franchised uh, regional representative um, basis, but it's. Uh, it's it, it, it's it's online. Um, it's an online hybrid agency, a bit like the sort of purple bricks. It's it's uh, it's it's profitable, growing very strongly, and it's just 
just you know it, it, that were to be split off and floated as a as a sort of a digital type business i'm sure it'll have a lot more value yeah. attached to it than and it's it got a good three and a half percent dividend yield as well hasn't it so yeah um, yeah it's got it, it's yeah. got it ticks all the right but as long as the, as long as the housing market doesn't fall out of bed and let's be yeah. clear about it if we're if we're positive on, on inflation I, it's going to be more elevated for longer then the house prices are going to stay firm aren't they and interest rates yeah. are going to stay lower well, I, th- I think, I think, yeah. I mean, obviously, a big interest rate shock wouldn't help. But I don't think, and you know, if we, we we don't get ourselves out of the corner, we're painted into by jacking them up to five or six percent overnight. So, no. um, yeah, all those points are valid. Um, it, it, you know, my my, my top down view also points me to more to value stocks than, than, yeah. than to growth, multiple com- compression fears, and and, and so on. Uh, and the other point as well, obviously, on this one is that um, it's it, it's not really a it's, it's not a pure geared play on house prices or something it's you know because yeah. of that letting space and the yeah. franchise model and so on so i think it's it looks like a you know a, 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 to me just a, a, a very solid yeah and a very solid pick yeah now jack i now it's a bit sort of like a bit bigger than the normal small cap but royal mail falls into the cheapest chip spot in fact you're a very good company because i know andy bruff pointed this out to me about six months ago <laughs> And I was looking at the sort of the shares. They're about four ninety, but they're, they're trading on like six times earnings for next year. And they've got to cash on the balance sheet. Well, what mm. sort of peak? Other than obviously the outstanding value there, not to send a first class stamp, but basically to buy the shares. But what sort of like dr- dr- drives you to sort of the Royal Mail? You're correct. That is, uh, it's off my patch a little bit. But what, what I have been finding is there is being used to small caps. Recently, when I'm venturing into large caps, I am seeing some striking valuations. And mm. uh, to David's point about just value in general, you, you'll find some of the best value right now in bigger companies. And Royal Mail, of course, yeah, some of the, the metrics are just uh, just pretty notable. So it's, you know, EV, EBITDA of around four times, forecast P ratio of about eight times. Mm. Looks like a forecast yield of about 5%. It just... Uh, recently announced a 200 million pound special dividend 200 million pound share buyback i think the market caps what just under 5 billion so great returns to shareholders right now and then beyond that what royal mail group is actually doing that's of interest is it's it's refocused more on on parcels and that's an area that's growing more as you know how everyone shops these days yeah. e-commerce just, Exactly. And, you know, Royal Mail, it's, it's an old company at its core. Uh, so there might be some maybe some culture issues. It's a big, you know, bureaucratic company, but it's been around delivering things for well over a century. It's, it's got an incredible brand to it. And it's recently made a, a big acquisition and it's, it's, it's trying to grow an overseas market. So I, I think it's an interesting one, especially at the valuation. And you just consider, you know, you might walk past it and think, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty boring. It's cheap, but boring. But th- there's some structural trends on its side. And, and the, the valuation is just um, quite interesting. Yeah, I did also read in their last trading update or their results or something that they, they did say that there was no synergies or very little synergies between the Royal Mail and their overseas operations, GLG, which is the, the biggest sort of unbundling sign I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. So uh, we'll wait and see on that with Patrick. But I'm a great, I agree, you know, for investors who are sort of like, you know, widows and orphan stock, have a look at, uh, at the Royal Mail. Now, David, on that property theme, you've moved into the Chinese property, sorry, the Chinese, theme, not the Chinese, definitely not the Chinese, <laughs> into the Scottish property sector which is with Springfield Properties. Yeah. Now, I, I, I remember covering these and they were always good value, but they're still terrific value at sort of £1.40. Sort of do take us through that thesis. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're, you're right. I mean, I think it's, it is just a cheap share. It's probably not that well, possibly not, not, not that well known since it, I think they listed... Uh, just about three they, years ago, I went, think, at about yeah, a quid about or something, that, or quid ten. Yeah, it's about that. And, and it's still um, very big. Um, he's been diluted down because he's um, they, they've issued shares in, in part consideration for some acquisitions they've been doing, which was exactly what they said they'd do when they, that was a reason for coming public, um, to, 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 to use, this, use the stock market to, to make infill acquisitions and to grow. Um, but there's a there's a, there's a significant um, founder ownership there, which I, I quite like. It's a it's a very as you might imagine, they're very Scottish, very conservative, they're very prudent. Um, 
and they've just done a deal uh, to acquire on well, to a very very good terms uh, a house builder up in Inverness which sort of just consolidates a small position they had in the Highlands I mean they've, they've mainly been some sort of central belt um, in, in in Scotland um, they have quite I mean I'm, again you might worry about justifiably if you've got a bad view on house prices but they do have a quite a nice um, business building uh, affordable housing um, for the basically government backed bodies uh, Scottish government's got a very um, you know quite an aggressive um, uh, plan to expand the uh, construction of, um, of, of affordable housing sort of housing association type stock and uh, Springfield got some long-term contracts uh, re re um, related to that um, but it's, it's just basically, I think, a very sensibly run house builder. The deal they've done in, up in Inverness, um, it's uh, the, the land bank there is pretty much, I think, all paid for. Uh, it's not to, it's, it's so the, the, you know, they've, they've effectively paid up front for that. So it'll, that will release cash as it gets built out rather than having to uh, purchase land which is under contract. Um, and it was, I think it was a very, very, you know, attractive looking deal. I mean, it's on about eight times and a rising five percent yield um it just looks just yeah it just looks too cheap again i don't think it's something that's going to double overnight obviously but it's uh i think just a, a, if you're looking for if you're looking for value bit of an inflation hedge uh good yield uh and and sensible prudent management you know then i think it's a you know a, a nice one yeah no i would agree and also i think the price to book is is lower than the uh about 10 percent, 20 percent less than the actual market because uh you know, it hasn't really been seen a great deal. So if you want to go into sort of the house builders, this seems a pretty sensible, uh, pretty sensible option. Now, moving to DIY, uh, Jack. Oh, Wix is one of your, uh, your, your, your preferred plays. And I guess that's sort of like carrying on with the, uh, the theme that everybody's been doing at their houses, uh, putting new uh, windows and door frames and stuff. Do you want to take us through the old Wix? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, it's those, those trends. Why Wix? is interesting to me is it was a spin-off from Travis Perkins and oh, yes. and sometimes spin-offs up are, are you know quite interesting situations in and of themselves to to look into as it was one division of a big company now it's you know freed up independent free to invest in its stores and and really kind of uh, drive some strategic momentum so I think it's quite well placed really to, so there might be some structural or yeah, structural trends backing it up, but then also some company specific drivers that management can go with. And I've, uh, I've watched a couple of their presentations. They come across as quite high quality and the valuation again, is just not that demanding. I suppose mm. what you would, what people are thinking is, is this some kind of peak uh, you know, IPOs don't have the best reputation sometimes for for being opportunistically timed, but I I just think it's it's quite good value. It's it's possibly just a bit too cheap, and I I think that's an, that's it in a nutshell, really. Mm -hmm. And they also do I think is do it for me as well that type of service. So certainly it'd certainly help because I'm I'm useless at DIY, but I definitely go to a retailer who, yeah. who can sell me the products and then install a door or something because. Wouldn't know which 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 place to put the hinges. Yeah, Never mind yeah. where the door was. You don't want to see my IKEA flat packs, but um, <laughs> yeah, do it for me. That's a good point. It, it makes it you know that that model is just that bit harder to replicate. The workforce needs to be that bit more skilled. It's also got quite a good digital offering, so it's quite a balanced mm -hmm. uh, business, and it occupies a, a fairly unique spot in the market. I'd say for those facts. Yeah. And on, on that um, sort of like uh, the building theme, I think, David, you quite like another one of those cheapest chips, Samero, which I understand uh, is also a favourite stock of Paul Scott as well from Stockopedias. And uh, do you want to take us through that one? Because I think it's, it's in this sort of like the construction, isn't it? Sort of like level. level yeah, I, I, th I think it is. It, it, it's got a justifiably, I think, good following in the uh, in, in small cap land. I, I, I think I've referred to it in in GCI as a, as a fan yeah. favourite uh, previously, and I was I put it in because um, I was just minded of um, back in my fund management days was a strategist I used to enjoy talking to called Rob Buckland, who was at City, and he used to every year produce a a note called the uh, the Christmas lunch. And it was the idea being rather like we're doing now about picking your, your ideas for next year. And there's always a temptation to go for some sort of beaten up recovery stock, you know, which is, is, is you know, hammered down. It's going to really rebound next year, give you plenty of upside. And I think he pointed out that actually if you just go with last year's winners, 
and go with them again. Uh, that tends to be the winning the winning strategy on a, on a percentage basis. It'll be the odd year when you get that big inflection, but generally speaking. And this one's got terrific momentum, which I thought, well, why not? Why not go with it? Because it's, it's, it's done very, very well. It's had a, an extremely good uh, good good year. I'm just telling What's you. What's the drivers for it? Because it makes basically levelling. Yeah, it's a guided levelling machines. That... I mean, it's up 73% this, this year, but it's on 11 times and a 5.5% yield net cash in the balance sheet. So... What I, I, maybe it'll do another seventy three percent next year, but I think yeah. terrific momentum. What it's benefiting from it does it does laser guided screed machines. So if you're a if you're a building contractor uh, and you want to lay a perfectly flat uh, concrete floor, then it's much more efficient and quicker and so on to to use one of their laser guided machines to to help you lay the concrete. Um, it's predominantly it's a US based company. It's predominantly I think seventy odd about seventy five percent of the sales are in the US. Benefiting hugely from investment in uh, in warehouse space uh, for e-commerce and so on. If, you, if, you, if you're you know building an Amazon warehouse covering several football pitches, you want that high quality, super flat floor. And if, if you get that, that allows you to take the racking right the way up to the ceiling. And you know, so they've, they've been benefiting obviously from a, a, a sort of well, not just a capex cycle, it's a sort of secular trend towards these mm-hmm. big slabs uh, going down. Um, and it's a it's a it's a high margin business, um, capital light, very cash generative. Mm. You know, it, it just ticks all those wonderful boxes you look for in a in a growth company. And then you layer on top of that the valuation. Um, yeah, I must I, admit it must have something because in the construction building industry to generate operating profit margins of thirty two percent, then uh, that's absolutely fabulous. And they'll presumably yeah. I mean, they'll it's also a very, it's a very presum- They'll presumably benefit from the infrastructure bill that the Congress have been trying to pass for flipping ages, but it will definitely come at some point in time. Yeah, I, I, I mean, they're, they're just the, the one thing I, where I would be a little bit critical is uh, they've, they've they've not really nailed any of their overseas territories. Um, they've they've had, you know, they, they've been hammering away at China for ages, and they just can't really seem to get that going. I feel they ought to have a bigger business in Europe than they have. Um, but it, even so, I mean, it's kind of been dwarfed by the US just being so strong so, in that sort of domestic market. I mean, it is cyclical. They know that. And that's why they, you know, they, they, their aim is to retain a $20 million net cash buffer on the balance sheet and then distribute um, to shareholders it, the excess cash beyond that, uh, which builds up. Um, yeah, it is cyclical, but then it's on a cyclical type rating on 11 times. I would get worried if it, if, if it got re-rated, which you could justifiably do, you know, re-rated up to a high teens multiple or something, then that would worry me because, you know, the market tends to make the mistake of putting a uh, cyclical stop, you know, <laughs> thinking, oh, it's different this time. You know, you re-rate, uh, you, you re-rate the top of the cycle. Um, and But, you know, clearly that's not happened here. And yeah, um, yeah it's, it's very much a favourite. I mean, I've owned it myself for an awfully long time. Uh, you know, and it's 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 in my portfolio as I run in, in growth company investor, and um, I, I think, as I say, it's a great momentum stock, and I don't see any reason why it should, um, you know, it, it should slow down short term. You're the only investor I've ever met, David, who's worried if your stock goes up. <laughs> I, oh. I, I would be delighted in trimming profits, but anyway, that's a separate argument. Um, yeah, we've got two uh, motor retailers to uh, to run through. You both like this sector. Again, with great company, because I know Andy Broth likes it. Start with uh, yourself, uh, Jack, with Vertu, which is, I think, owns Bristol Street Motors, doesn't it? Mm. So where to start with car dealers at the moment? It's, uh, it's a it's gold a crazy mine. time. Yeah, <laughs> well, it is, it is. And obviously, the, the big overarching question is how long will current dynamics last and how big a risk is mean reversion and what does normal look like beyond that uh you know it's it's the it's the supply chain shortages that are pushing up used car margins it's it's led to a, a re-rating in the sector it's still all like very cheap has been cheap as chips as you might say mm-hmm. for quite a long time it's re-rated a bit still very cheap and then especially there's a there's quite a big valuation discount between the the old school car retailers and you know the the more disruptive mm-hmm. online entrants when in fact from what i see when when i meet the management of say marshall motors which i used to hold as well um in fact i basically just recycled the marshall motors into virtue um they they spend good money on their tech 
their tech platforms as well. They're, they're not just, you know, like 70s um, mm-hmm. car dealerships. They're, they're good businesses that invest in their businesses. And so the sector's in play. The, the, it looks like there's more and more activity right now. Uh, I, I just think underpinned by the, the valuations, you know, the freehold assets, the strong balance sheets and the trading momentum, uh, it's it's an interesting sector. Going back to the first point, you know, how does it all end? That's that's the big question. But for right now, it seems like a, a good spot to me. Yeah, well, we all need cars, don't we? I haven't been able to get them for about <laughs> five months. So uh, yeah. it's got to be a good support. What about you, Dave? Because I know you noticed you like Motorpoint, don't you? Which is, I think, it's, it's, it's slightly different, isn't it, in certain respects. But uh, obviously, it's a car yeah. dealer. But it's got a, it's an auction for, for cars dot website or something. They, they have that. Um, I mean, it is it is a very different uh, model to a traditional car detail. I mean, I mean Jack mentioned that freehold uh, property, and I I used to uh, talk to Cambri- Cambrian a lot, who uh, take themselves mm. private. And uh, every time I speak to management there, they were banging on about the freehold property values and and so on, and the frustration they have about not being reflected in the shares. And this is a very different model. Um, they have. They, they operate from large uh, sort of tertiary sites, which are um, are leased. I mean, they they they'll acquire a site, de- develop it as they need it for their operations, and they'll then they'll lease it. So it's a capital light uh, light model. Um, it's, it operates entirely in the uh, what they call nearly new sector. They've just yeah. pushed it out a little bit to sort of up to four years old because of the problems in getting stock, um, and they also have the auctions for you. Um, uh, so cars for you um, website, uh, which uh, which they use to um, uh, to disperse stock that they can't uh, sell on through through their sort of conventional model. Uh, it's really growth stock. Uh, this one, um, it's on uh, current year sort of seventeen times falling to sort of fourteen, falling to eleven, um, and they've accelerated their ex- their expansion and their investment, which is just sort of suppressed slightly. Um, near-term earnings but if you're going to have to suppress your near-term earnings then this is a good market to do that in because it's very very buoyant um, well what really attracts me to it is that they sell as many cars online as kazoo do and kazoo is valued at uh Kate went, went public in this in the states on a spire spac structure currently valued at three and a half billion um, and most point of a 300 million market cap and they're the same size doing the same thing pretty much apart from yeah. the fact that um, Kazoo's got gazillions of, uh, of, of, of marketing dollars that it's just, you know, spending and therefore it's in loss, whereas Motorpoint's actually, yeah. you know, very, very, very firmly profitable and, and cash generative. Um, so I, I just think it's it's a bit of a, you know, it, it's a bit of a valuation anomaly for the growth they're getting. Um, and, you know, it's a used car market is enormous and their market share is still sort of very much in this sort of, you know, single uh, single digit uh, area, and they're yeah. expanding geographically as well as digitally online. I also think that the hybrid model in this space is very strong. Um, you know, because a lot of people, even if you might you might order your car online and so on, but you literally want to kick the tires mm-hmm. um, in a lot in a lot of cases. They will do completely online delivery and, and so on if, if you want to. But I think having that hybrid bricks and clicks mm-hmm. uh, model is uh, is is I think better than uh, Kazoo's, uh, you know, 100% disruptive uh, approach. Yeah, well, maybe, um, maybe, so that's, really maybe, like that's a, maybe that's a 2022 opportunity for uh, for you, David, and growth uh, company investor. You can set up your own SPAC in the States and buy uh, and buy <laughs> Motorpoint and list it because I think you'll make 10 times your money <laughs> if your maths is right. There's an arbitrage opportunity. Um, yeah, now, yeah move- well- yeah, now moving Jack to uh, to Winstay. Now this is uh, you again. You're in good company because I know um, Judith McKenzie of Downing likes um, these, and this is an agricultural play. They're sort of like uh, they deliver everything like fertilizer and food. Tell us what they do anyway. Yeah, it's perennially off the radar. Winstay is. Going back to Springfield properties and you know Scottish management away from the city. I think Winstay has its roots as a as a Welsh. Farmers Union, I think, or cooperative. Wow! And uh, yeah, that was about a hundred years ago, <laughs> and it's just been um, it's been growing steadily for a long time. Really, it's got a, a few divisions. It's got arable and specialist agriculture. Um, one sort of a delivering, you know, uh, 
wheat and, and feed to farmers and the other is, is just more like specialist countryside shops for that industry. It's very low margin, but if you actually look a bit beyond that, it's a part of the business model. The business itself is actually very cash generative. The earnings are, are very robust and it's got um, a very low risk, I would say, expansion strategy. It's, it's very boring and just doing exactly what it has done for a long time, i.e. organic investment and then small bolt-on acquisitions of similar businesses around the country to build out its, its national uh, presence. I, I think it's one side of the country anyway, it's not present in. Um, and so it's just sort of quietly acquiring businesses around there. I think if you talk about inflation risks and things like that, Winstay is the kind of company that should mm. be able to pass them on. It will stay low margin, but it will be able to pass things on. And uh, it's it's got a phenomenal uh, dividend track record. Uh, there's something refreshingly old school about it as an investment i think you could probably just tuck it away i think you can even get script dividends there so you could just buy and hold and forget and and let the income kind of flow in and with some some capital appreciation over the long term yeah it sort of like um brings us of another word doesn't it to harvesting your dividends i guess <laughs> in yeah. the agricultural yeah so uh yeah I and mean, i think the i think a lot of the farmers also are experiencing a pretty good climate at the moment this year aren't they but it's quite i think farm gate prices are quite firm in terms particularly in, in grains and this sort of stuff as there's just a shortage of bringing anything in in new isn't it from overseas yeah yeah correct i mean that uh, it you know it swings both ways sometimes wednesday will report on the softening farm gate prices it is cyclical in that regard uh but for now yeah it's definitely kind of in more in a more favorable environment I actually look at it as if you want to, you, you can trade it, um, but I do think of it more as a as a, a nice, boring, long term buy and hold kind of thing that should grow through cycle. Mm. What about and then moving on to um, on to all things marine, David? Uh, Brymar Shipping, which is a ship broker. Could you take us through? Uh, again, that is super cheap, and uh, yeah. presumably they're, they're benefiting by uh, by the supply chain problem, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 it's, it's clearly a, an interesting uh, environment at the moment uh, for in, intermediaries to, you know, add value um, in, in, in the freight chain. But um, we well, can't I, get I mean, a ship anywhere, can you? I mean, well, that's it. Like so, I mean, the, 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 the story here, I think, I think, I mean, go back 20 years and there were two, a tale of two ship brokers, both selling for two pounds a share. Uh, Braemar is still two pounds a share, and Clarkson's gone to thirty-seven pounds and a P of twenty-four. Um, Braemar, uh, you can see, you might figure out one might have been slightly better managed than the uh, the other yeah. over the last two decades. And Braemar, yeah, basically, it's had too much debt. It's made some bad acquisitions, um, and you know, it, it just basically gone gone nowhere. It's been a great disappointment. Uh, now, there's uh, been management change. Um, and the chap who's running the company uh, now actually was originally a shipbroker at Clarkson's years ago, then ran um, a, a, in the private sector, a privately held shipbroking company, which Braemar acquired in 2014. So he'd actually been running, and then he started to run the shipbroking leg within Braemar. Uh, but he's become CEO. Uh, they're getting out of um, uh, some of the diversifications uh, that they made mm. uh, that's helped clean up the balance sheet so debt is now coming back under control I think it's I think it's scheduled to be sort of about one times EBITDA so on a you know looking forward yeah. so I mean that's now that's now much less of an issue um, and it's it's just focusing back on shipbroking so the argument is that uh, you know it, it's, it's, it's dry clearly, bulk, that, isn't it it's basically hardcore sort of iron ore and stuff but it's also seeing apparently they do they do they do. They do the full range. I mean, tankers a bit were were the biggest uh, oil tankers. Yeah, they were the biggest leg of it, and, and obviously benefit. If you remember when the oil price went negative, and mm. people were just desperate trying to find anywhere to store oil. So I mean, tankers were very well bid uh, last year, but they've they've come off the boil this year, and, and the dry bulk ciders. So it's it's, it, it's 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 really quite quite diversified. They've got a um, you know they advise on. Uh, Sales and purchases, uh, as, as well as the um, you know the the the, the ordering of, of of tankers and and ship and boats and 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 so on. I shouldn't call them boats, should I ship? Um, so it, it, it's yeah, it's it's really a sort of um, a management story, refocusing 
uh, you're not paying anything for it at the moment. It's on sort of earnings. Um, you know, if they, you know, if they successfully grow, they've got a, they've got a plan to try and double uh, revenues on a, I think, a sort of four or five year view, which implies 15% revenue mm-hmm. growth per annum. There'll be some acquisitions there, possibly bringing in teams, uh, you know, because that's, that's, you know, more viable way of doing it than paying a premium for a corporate entity. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if, if they do manage to get onto, you know, into sort of double digit revenue growth, um, you know, as a focused broking firm, off this valuation, then I think it, you know, it could do extremely well on the, you know, uh, and particularly given the the valuation umbrella provided by Clarks, and you know, on a sort of mid twenties yeah. multiple, you know, it's potentially a long way to go. If you, you know, if they, but they've got to do it, of course. But you know, it, it just looks like a, you know, you're not paying much for the um, much for the, the chance of success. Yeah, um, Jack, just on just on more broadly, how do you assess the sort of management? Because obviously, you know. It's key. It's a key issue with turnarounds or value plays or any sort of stuff. How do you just broadly sort of like assess a management team and whether they're the right people to to drive the shares? It's a good question. I, it's something I've been thinking more and more about quite recently, actually, because particularly in the small cap space, I think quite a lot comes down to the quality of the management teams. Mm. And you know, everyone loves to talk about a good moat and everything like that, but below a, a certain threshold, often the, the primary driver is the, the quality and depth of management. I know lots of small caps that could do well and could take market share, but they just don't have the right people in, in the job. So I, I, I think it's good if you see uh, management teams where they have pretty much direct experience and they're just replicating a pre-existing strategy. If they've got a solid experienced team and they're bringing in people they know uh, things like that. If obviously, if they're buying stock, that's always good. Mm. Um, but yeah, th- those those are probably like the the key things. I think experience is a really big deal. Like I I I don't actually have any leisure stocks right now, but the, my my longest holding there was Fulham Shore, and I I understand a lot of the arguments against restaurants as listed investments. But uh, that's because I, I really rated the management there and I understood they've basically done the exact same thing with Pizza Express in the 90s that they were now doing with Frank Manka. Mm-hmm. And now it's, it's still quite interesting because obviously it's a much more favorable uh, rental backdrop. But, you know, that it just shows like the, the power of management teams because some listed peers there just, just went absolutely nowhere. And it's because they're probably encountering problems for the first time that the Fulham Shore team had had figured out 25 years ago. Mm. Yeah, I, I actually find that the, the two biggest ingredients is one, the person at the top needs hunger. No mm. doubt about it. Regardless of what they do, they yeah. can't just be sitting there taking a check. And I think the other thing that I always find is actually the chairman needs to be pretty much independent. He's got to be able to kick the CEO and be totally, you know, sort of like objective mm. of how the business is performing. Because if the guy doesn't perform, then he's got to kick him out or get rid of him or, or, or move him on. So there's got to be that sort of risk and reward for the CEO in terms of incentivization. But also, if you don't, you're going out, you know, and that's where the, the chairman. And, and unfortunately, too many big caps as well as small caps fall down on the hunger and on the uh, on the on the independence, I think, mm. which is a... Uh, so it can be a bit of an issue. Now, just moving on to um, McFarland, um, uh, Jack. Now, I understand you quite like this one, which is a cardboard packaging and then sort of adhesive labels, doing well, I presumably, on the back of e-commerce. But uh, do you want to take us through that one? Yeah, exactly. There's, there's another e-commerce angle here. It's, uh, again, in keeping with things like Wednesday and um, Springfield, McFarland has its roots in Glasgow. The, the headquarters still in Glasgow. And it's just a, a very, I think on Stockopedia, it still qualifies for, yeah, a neglected firm screen, even though it has been re-rating quite a lot recently. Um, but it's actually, it's, it's just another resilient business model. It's, it's got uh, cyclical exposure to input prices and things like that. But uh, I mean, the economy needs packaging. And mm. McFarlane has a good track record of steady growth here. It's another kind of low risk low execution risk growth strategy that's been in play for a long time already. Again, it's just kind of organic investment aligning with growth sub-markets like e-commerce and then uh, bolt-on acquisitions. 
Mm. And the thing about McFarlane is, uh, as it does these bolt-on acquisitions, it's, it's getting some really good scale economies, and you're seeing a, a quite an encouraging uh, drive in operating margins and expansion there. So I think as it continues to do this, you might be able to see that uh, that sort of double whammy of earnings growth and then better margins leading to a re-rating of, of the shares. So I, I think it's a good, good prospect, really. And it's, it's one of those that's just kind of hiding in plain sight, doing what it says it's doing. Mm. Yeah, you would have thought, certainly, if they can come up with innovative new materials that are more, as the, as the world sort of like embraces more gr- all things green and environmental, mm. they should be able to push their, uh, their margins up, particularly on the, on the e-commerce side. Mm. Um, now, just coming back to that management theme, David, Supreme. Now, the, the shares have, have been yeah. smoked. They're the vaping boys, but they've done the, the shares have been smoked. And I think on the back of <laughs> a brilliant, a brilliant CEO, sort of like, is it, uh, is it Sandy Chadal or something like that? Sandy, I've never yeah, spoken to yeah. But- yeah, no, I mean, it's, I'm just picking up on the, on the management theme. And I, I, uh, I, I do between, I guess, 250 and 300, you know, company interviews, uh, a year and I, I did a couple this morning before uh, coming on the call um so it's, it's it's very much part of the sort of you know growth company investor sort of process and it, it is a very lucky position to be in to be able to sort of chat to people like sandy because i mean he's, he's a very he's a, a great guy i mean it's uh, very entrepreneurial and and you look at it and it looks like a bit of a rag bag there's, mm. there's vaping they're going into vitamins there's uh, battery distribution light bulbs and you think, oh, what a horrible looking conglomerate. But actually, I mean, he's a terrific entrepreneur. Um, he just, he's just a moneymaker. Um, I really like his, uh, his, his uh, CFO as, as well. I think, uh, I'm trying to remember her name, Suzanne. I think she's very, comes across very well. Uh, I'm well on top of the, uh, the the business also. But, you know, he's he's still got a very significant stake in it. So the, the owner, manager, entrepreneur, I think, very conservative as well. He's not somebody, I'm back on the point about, you know, the need to, you know, keep uh, keep management's under control. He's not, you know, he's a significant old owner of the business and he's not going to go off uh, leveraging it up and, you know, going mad. So I, I, I feel very, very comfortable there. Uh, the vaping business is terrific they've 88 vape i mean they've got a very strong market position there in the value end they're increasing distribution i think they've just got uh, sainsbury's on board um they're they're, they're they're a market leader and um you know extremely strong position in, in a category where i think advertising brand advertising so on has been um has now been more controlled than it was which makes it harder for uh for, 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 for new i also entrants. saw the nhs basically saying that um uh, they're rubber stamped it, haven't they, as a way yeah. of getting people well, there's, off, uh, there's talk, there's talk of it, you know, getting on prescript, you know, being actually prescribed to people, you know, as a smoking cessation. Mm. Um, uh, and I think the, the stats seem to be pretty compelling on that. They've also got a, a contract with the prison service as a supplier of, of vaping uh, to, 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 to the prisons. And I think they've extended that into the Scottish prison service as well. So there's, I think there's very strong growth there. It's very cash generative. Uh, margins are improving because they've been bringing more of the manufacturing and so on in, in-house. Um, and the real money is in the liquids rather than the, all the paraphernalia you yeah. need to use them. Um, and they're doing, um, they're moving into another uh, category, which I think is the most exciting bit, which will be the real driver of growth in the next two or three years, which is uh, sports, uh, nutrition and, and wellness, which is, you know, it's all sort of protein stuff mm. for, 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 for sports people, but also uh, vitamins. And again, the price points here are are very low. Uh, you know, they're really coming in at um, you know, undercutting uh, other brands and, and and so on. And they distribution into the supermarket chains. They've also got a direct consumer. Um, they've, they've introduced um, a product where you can uh, vitamin product where you can subscribe, and uh, it's it's very little money, and you get this, the the vitamins through the post and everything. So it's a it's a big category. They're bringing the manuf- again the manufacturing there in house. It's going to be very good for margins. Um, so I think you know on a uh, PE of where are we? About 14, 15 times, three and a half yield. Uh, very good growth, um, cash generative, uh, entrepreneurial management. Uh, yeah, I think it's just a, a, another sort of ticks very all the good, right boxes. Solid, yeah, very solid pick. And it, again, it's not going to double overnight, but you know, I, I think it will just. You wake up in two or three years' time and think, well, actually, it's, it's, yeah, it's done pretty well. Uh, yeah. so, um, 
Now, moving on to things which are moving, which are actually faster growers. We've got a central Nick uh, Jack that I, he's a bit of a like a, a mini go daddy, isn't he, out the States? Presumably there's an arbitrage play there as well. Maybe a, maybe David can arrange a SPAC out there and uh, we can put it on NASDAQ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dave, the SPAC guy. Um, yeah, so a bit of a change of pace now. Central Nick is, uh, yeah, you're right. It's sort of like GoDaddy. In fact, it, it recently uh, acquired a senior heavyweight sounding CTO hire. I, I forget his name now. It's Carlson Syrup, maybe. Mm. And uh, he he's from GoDaddy. Or he, he has experience there. What Central Nick does is it, it, it boils down to two divisions as online presence and online marketing. An online presence is like the very kind of nuts and bolts. Here's what you need to have a website and an internet presence. Yeah, yeah here's your website. Here's your email address, things like that. And then uh, those customers pay Central Nick an, an annual fee. So again, it's a kind of, uh, it's a very recurring revenue cash generative model in, in both divisions. So that's online presence. I can't. I think that market. They say it's about forty billion dollars globally. So that's a big market. But then, what's more interesting here is that they're getting into online marketing, which you know everyone knows things like Tremor, and then even higher valuations beyond that in in Nasdaq, as you say. And this market's much bigger. It's about four hundred billion dollars globally. Obviously, you've got. Uh, some big players there like Google and Facebook and Amazon, and they probably own big chunks of that market. But the management has said they they can see immediately sort of a $50 billion area there they can grow into and possibly more beyond that, but based on sort of niches in that market. And so how the online marketing works is, uh, again, it, it, it owns a platform similar to Tremor, and it, it basically matches uh, advertisers with site owners who can publish those adverts and then it's got all sorts of artificial intelligence algorithms machine learning kind of things very smart stuff that sit in the middle and just optimally match the two parties across its platform so that now, business that, will that be okay will that with all the, the, the google tracking you know basically the cookie tracking being moved particularly on apple and then going away on google in about will that how will that be effective? Because you won't be able to actually track people around the web. But you, if you've got first party data, you're, you're fine. Mm. Yeah. So Central Nick says that it's, uh, it's a core part of its strategy is sort of privacy safe kind of methods of, of doing business. So it said itself that what like other competitors are suffering from those dynamics. Mm. Uh, Central Nick itself is is not. And, you know, if, if anything, it's a market share opportunity for them. If, if you were to ask me exactly how the tech works on why they don't, why it doesn't apply to them, I, I don't know that. But mm. all, all I know is that the, the organic growth rates picking up after a round of a couple of years of acquisitions is kind of assembling again, you know, shades of tremor. It's assembling a platform of sufficient scale. It is growing organically, and that growth is picking up. And management says it's it's made a concerted effort to make sure that isn't an issue for the way Central Nick conducts business. Right, great. Well, it's I mean, I, you know, it's, it, you know that about it. Online commerce is only growing, and I think the pandemic has meant that there's a have been a deluge and continue to will be of people setting up their own businesses and doing, uh, you know, setting up their own online um, little companies where they have need a warehouse, they need a they need a digital presence, and then they just deliver and deliver it all online. So mm. should be well well set for it. Mm. Yeah, it's, this is most definitely you know a, a different risk reward profile to a few of the companies we've been talking about so far. Mm. It's a it's a newer market with much higher growth rates, much larger. But yeah, obviously, of course, there, there will always be kind of new emerging risks to navigate. So higher risk, yeah. higher reward. Yeah, and moving that moving that through as well, though, David, you you put a, you sort of nailed your master cerulean, which is done tremendously well, but is actually trading at sort of like quite a full price over seven times sales according to my estimates but uh it's a quality business with recurring revenue streams in a telco space i guess yeah i i, I thought i ought to put one uh, one name in for the growth uh, growth boys um yeah. and um but I, I i the reason i chose cerulean i mean i mean clearly you know some of the sort of super premium stocks have you know struggled recently and seen a seen mm. something of a derating. Um, this one's kind of held held pretty firm. It's on about 28 times currently and then falling to 23 prospectively. So it's not sort of 
completely in nosebleed territory. It does, um, it's, it's billing uh, software and customer relationship management software, mainly for uh, phone companies, mobile companies, and, uh, and so on. It's been around a long time. It, I think it was originally a management buyout uh, from uh, from Logica, which is a, a, a name of people in my vintage will remember. Yeah, from, that's uh, a long time ago. From that .com is. 1.0. Um, uh, so it's been, it's, it's a point there being it's, it's, it's a long established business. It's got some, you know, uh, a strong customer base, you know, uh, entrenched customers, uh, very low uh, churn, churn rates, um, you know, it's a mission critical uh, products that they're, they're, they're selling. Uh, I, I, spoke, I spoke to them um, earlier in the year and uh, wrote them up in, in, in the mag and spoke to them again more recently. And they were clearly, the confidence came across. They're clearly very confident with how the business is performing and what the prospects are for the next two or three years, which I think could see it just, just migrate into a much bigger sort of uh, stratum of within this sort of small and where's their customers space. geographically is it is it in the uk or is it overseas no it's it's, it's very much a global a, a global right. business and okay. i think they there, there are two two key elements here one is that they're starting to win um bigger customers bigger accounts um you know their credibility is is uh uh, you know, it's improved. I mean, if you're going to if you're going to jump into bed with a new uh, you know software provider for your billing system and so on, you've got to be very confident that they can mm. deliver and, and it works and so on. So they're, they're, I think they're, I think they're um, you know they're, they're moving up in terms of getting bigger bigger contracts, bigger customers, which is obviously more profitable. Um, and also, they are using increasingly um, partners and resellers to help implement the software. There's quite a quite a bit of service and uh, con- consultancy revenue in, in the mix at the moment. I think the ship that the, the software element of sales is going to take a bigger slice of the pie, which means margins will be will be increasing as well. So I think yeah, I think they seem to be very set well set for you know strong growth in the top line and improving margins over over, over time. And I think as the company gets gets bigger, it'll get more of a following and potential for re-rating. All, of course, with the, uh, you know, the warning sticker that, uh, you know, this is a justifiably so a premium rated growth stock. And therefore, you know, um, could it go, you know, could it go from 23 times suddenly be derated to 18? Well, well why not? Um, could it go to 35 times? Entirely possibly. Yeah. <laughs> but I think at these sort of levels, I can kind of live with it for that momentum. And and I think particularly, you know, the improving profile that it will no, yeah, good quality that. stock, basically. Um, now, on that uh, telco theme, Jack, uh, I see you've gone for um, Airtel Africa, which is one of the big sort of uh, mobile operators, I think, down in uh, into the Nigerian places, isn't it, or something? Mm, yeah, it is. I, I think this is an interesting one. Uh, of course, there's there's jurisdictional risk, geography risk, as you might expect. Yeah, political. If, yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, if you're looking for exposure to Africa, then this is an interesting story, I think. It's telecoms in uh, 14 or 16 countries across Africa. Nigeria is by far the biggest in, in terms of kind of contribution. But what's interesting here is you have the telecoms infrastructure business, which is, you know, very high capex, mm. but exposed to, to much stronger kind of underlying growth than, you know, like European telecoms, but it is still that business model. Uh, but then uh, besides that, you have the the mobile money business, which is really interesting because the financial characteristics of the two are hugely different. And mobile money is, is much higher margin, much lower capex requirements. And it's been selling up to 25% of its stake in this mobile money business to people like MasterCard, things like that. And, and those, those sales are valuing that part of the business at $2.65 billion. Uh, Tell Africa itself is just under £5 billion. It's sort of re-rated recently as, uh, as the market slightly cottons on to that. But I think that's quite an interesting opportunity because in Africa, the, the banking infrastructure is still being built out. They call mm. they call it the unbanked. You know, there, there's lots of unbanked and, and lots of infrastructure still yet to be built because it's such a vast continent. It's not really going to be like the UK style of local bank branches. Mm. It's, it's been almost entirely bypassed in the same way some developing economies are bypassing personal computers and going straight to smartphones. 
uh, African uh, countries are going straight sort of uh, mobile money is much more transportable, much easier. And, and Airtel Africa has a really good kind of brand there across a lot of different countries. Mm. Yeah, I know. Uh, Justin Urquhart Stewart likes him as well. So uh, you're in good company. Now, moving to a, a, a sort of recovery stock, uh, David, Sicassia. Um, this is sort of like, a, I mean, I know Christopher Mills has got quite a big chunk of this one. So, uh, again, you've, you, 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 you've definitely rubbing shoulders with the right people. He thinks it's a, a very good stock. Yeah, I, I mean, this was a, a Neil Woodford back disaster. Um, That's right. Yeah, I, I mean, particularly they had a they had a phase three drug uh, which 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 failed, um, and they also had some other bits and pieces, and I think had a bad deal with Astra for for, for a product. And anyway, new management's come in, uh, backed by some pretty sensible um, big shareholders, as you mentioned, Paul. Uh, new management's come in with a mandate to just basically clean the whole thing up and focus on um, the NIOX uh, yeah. product, which is a test asthma for asthma. diagnostics. That's right, yeah. And and there's a, I mean, asthma's a huge market, um, but the surprisingly small percentage of people actually get a get this get this test. It's quite a cheap test. It's a primary care test. It can be done in doctor surgeries and so on. It's it's um, you basically blow into a, into a tube with. With, with a gizmo in it and, and that gives you your, 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 your reading. Um, so it's a razor blade type uh, mm. type business The tests themselves are relatively inexpensive to carry out. Um, obviously it was disrupted by um, issues with accessing uh, GPs and hospitals and, and so on during COVID, but hopefully that's, you know, hopefully that's mm. starting to, to normalize. Very much a global business. The UK is, is, is certainly a sort of minority of the, uh, of, of, of the revenue. Uh, so it's the sort of thing which would be very natural for one of the big, uh, you know, um, healthcare uh, service companies to to acquire at some point. Uh, the management are ex Bioquel. I think they they yeah. basically uh, turned that round and sold it. And I think I'd expect a similar sort of thing to happen here. Uh, stocks trading in the high 30s. It did get up to in, into the low 40s recently, but it's it's in the high 30s at the moment. Uh, the key target for the management team is that, is that all their incentives get paid out at 62.4p. So that's so, yeah, that's that's the, uh, the high that's, bar. That's a, that's a price I have in mind. Yeah. Um, and and uh, so the, the you know I'd expect a you know a, a sort of uh, takeover. Yeah. At, at, at some point, I mean, you probably have to be a bit patient with it. You know, maybe a couple of years, but um, you know, I just want to tuck away. Well, uh, you know. What is a, a, a very impressive management team? Um, you know, work uh, work their magic on it. Yeah. Now, Jack, you've gone from sort of like a couple of uh, big stocks. You've got Airtel and Africa, as I say, at about four, about six billion dollars, and uh, the, Royal, the Royal Mail at uh, nearly five billion pounds. But you also mentioned um, uh, Chroma Security, which is at the other end of the spectrum. Do you want to take us through that? Because it seems to be very much sort of like a, you know, just a a man security, CCTV sort of stuff for large corporates. Yeah, so throwing this one in for a bit of variety, I suppose it's, it's very much a micro cap. So I imagine it immediately ruled out for quite a few people. But for, for smaller, nimbler investors or people with higher conviction who can build stakes and, you know, have the patience to, to ride the opportunity cost out, I suppose, mm. then then things are looking quite good at Chroma Security. It's it's cash back. It's got net cash of however much five million maybe, and a, a tiny market cap. So when you when you consider the EV EBITDA, it's very small. I think it's about four times. And it's yeah, you're right. It's it's manned security, and then also sort of a locksmith security type shops mm. on on industrial estates and things like that. Uh, I, I just think it doesn't take a whole lot here to move the dial for a re-rating. And when you look at the recent updates, they're all positive. COVID was no way near as bad for the company as, as some people might have feared, uh, but it has been bad for some competitors. So the company's, you know, hinted at possible acquisition opportunities and consolidating. Uh, the, the organic trading's quite good. And then it's just a, a very low valuation. So uh, as you would expect, it to open up or acquire more stores. I don't, I just don't think it would take much to drive the share price. Having said that, we could quite easily be sat here in a year's time and it's gone nowhere because it's so small and yeah. so many people, you know, the, the people just don't care. It's a resounding wall of silence. What's the liquidity sometimes. like in it? 
It's it's small. It's small. I did um I did wonder whether to include this one or not. Yeah. But I I do think you know so I, I'm trying I'm being very upfront that it's not a. Uh, not liquid and probably not suitable for certain investors with certain risk profiles or, or sizes mm. of portfolios. But if, if it does apply to you, then it's potentially one worth checking out. Yeah, good. And then moving a bit the game a bit further up the uh, the food chain on the BlackRock World Mining Trust there, David, you've gone for, which is again in all things metals and mining, I guess, is what they invest in. Well, I, I have nothing really to add on this. It was just basically putting put in there as a sort of thematic thing. Is that the uh, yeah? You know, it's an industry that tends to move in long cycles. Um, we've had a long down cycle. Uh, we had a very good period of performance coming. Now, just I think a lot of these uh, mining stocks um, recently, but I just think uh, you know most of them are relatively modestly valued. There's a good dividend on this one. Um, it's on about a seven or eight discount as well. Um, and it just covers that, um, you know, that thematic uh, box. I'm absolutely, I'll admit to being uh, not terribly insightful when it comes to individual mining stocks, uh, but I, yeah. it's a theme I just feel I want to be on the right side of. And, you know, I get paid while I wait, the discount's fine. And, you know, in an inflationary environment, you know, I, I just want to have a decent amount yeah. of... Uh, a portfolio in that sort of thing. I guess it comes down to China, yeah. doesn't it? Basically, is, is if if that if they have to do some more stimulus to keep the economy rolling, then you're going to see more buildings, even though they've got a property problem. But uh, we'll wait and see. Now, moving into the financial sector, um, Rosenblatt or RBG Jack was a uh, one you mentioned, which I think does all things sort of like you know corporate sort of M and A uh, and insolvency. It's a really sort of like end to end law firm, isn't it? I think. Mm. Yeah, there's quite a lot of movement in this space right now. There's, there's mm. a few different listed uh, peers. That they're all sort of acquiring, rolling up, whatever you'd like to call it. The, the strategies can can differ slightly. But RBG, yeah, it's, um, it was Rosenblatt. It's still got Rosenblatt in its legal services division. It's acquired a, a company called Memory Crystal, another one called mm. Convex, which is sort of a boutique corporate M&A type stuff and, and the deal flow there is picking back up and then it's set up its own lionfish litigation financing branch which um, none, none of the outcomes of those cases are really in, in factors into broker forecasts which I think mm. is a useful little uh, hidden kicker there but really it's, it's a case of uh, integrating acquisitions and looking for potentially more what they tend to look for is uh, they they try to cherry pick the best businesses they can see so there's a there's a scalability question there with the strategy but can it grow further i, I think it probably could and why it's worth bringing up right now is obviously that there has been this sort of indexes don't seem to reflect the share price actions of quite a few companies right now so i suspect there's been a divergence within actual indexes and uh RBG is definitely one where it's, it's had a strong re-rating post-COVID, but then since uh, I suppose the halfway mark of this year, it's come back down again. And now you're looking at sort of forecast valuations of about 10 times earnings with a, a dividend yield forecast of just under 6%. Uh, and you, you consider the kind of growth CAGs it's been generating recently. It has said it's, it's going to focus on integrating a little more than acquiring uh, for at least the next year. But uh, I, I just think uh, in, in terms of valuation, maybe it's maybe it's uh, derated a little too far. Mm. Yeah, well, the whole sort of corporate um, sector services should be should do well, I would have thought as well. And the other bit is uh, you, you got the UK government who have decided to uh, end the moratorium on um, creditor protection mm. at the 1st of October, which again should help there sort of restructuring and um, insolvency businesses, I'm guessing. So, uh, And then finally, um, David, Randall and Quilt, you quite like this uh, non-life insurer, isn't it? What, what's the difference between this one and other non-life? It doesn't do disaster disaster uh, uh, insurance, does it? It does other types of lines of insurance. No, uh, it, it's, it's, it's what you might call sort of changing spots uh, story, this one. It, it, very, very interesting. it used to be run by Mr. Randall and Mr. Quilter, yeah, and it's specialised in acquiring legacy books of business. I mean, the way to think about it is, it's a company which allows insurance companies to 
optimize the, the capital allocation. So if you've got a closed, a closed book of business um, that requires you know, capital to support it while it runs off, um, you, you actually want to grow. So you, you sell it to a Randall and Quilter who'll take mm-hmm. it off your hands, freeze up the capital, you go off and do what you want to do, and they, th- th- they manage it right. in, in run off and so on. Now, that's quite a capital-intensive model. And to grow, they've, they've over the years, they've issued shares, raised equity and, and debt to, to fund these acquisitions. Now, as a new uh, CEO come in, very impressive uh, US chap. I had a you know, best part of an hour on, on a Teams call with him uh, a couple of months ago to really get to grips with it because these can be quite tricky things to get your heads around. So mm. keeping it simple, um, there, are, there, are, there are two arms of the business now. Uh, there is something called program management, which is where they, Randall, Randall and Quilter, effectively act as a middleman between taking books of business, taking business being written by what are called uh, managing general agents, uh, and they match it with um, uh, large, large reinsurance, large reinsurers who take the capital risk and so on, and they take a fee for managing that, that process. The legacy side, again, they've been managing to take capital out of this. They've done what's called, a, again, it's an insurance job, it's terrible, a sidecar deal where external investors uh, put capital into a joint venture vehicle, uh, which takes on the legacy book, Randall and Quill to retain a minority of it, but they crucially they take fees uh, for managing managing the book, and they, most of the capital is 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 effectively sort of uh, um, uh, sold out uh, to um, to the uh, to, to to the external investors. So the company is going from being very capital intensive to being a capital light fee generating business. Now, if you look at the sort of rating with, with very very high rates of repeat fee mm. income because of the the you know books of business, insurance business sustain. So that's the sort of thing which ought to be uh, on a, I think, in my view, a high teens, 20 times Marshmack type uh, type rating. Uh, going out two or three years as this transition comes through, uh, the forecasts are to have, have it on a single digit multiple. Yeah. So at the moment, you glance at it and you think, oh, gosh, this is complicated and looks expensive. How do I value it? couple of years' time, I think the story is going to be a lot, lot clearer. Um, valuation will be very attractive in the context of what ought to be much more highly rated uh, fee-based uh, revenue income. Uh, it's very hard to get across in, in two or three minutes. Yeah, it is uh, difficult. You're right. It's a bit um, of a black box. But, um, all, 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 I can, all I can say is take out a subscription, yeah. go to the archive and read the original article where I think in a thousand words, I actually think actually you know, it's one of the better, better written ones. I managed to distill it down quite, uh, quite, quite well. But I do think it's worth, well worth having a look at um, because, as I say, it's, it, it's one of those companies that's it's a significant company. But it, 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 it's evolving into, yeah. I think, a, a, a very attractive business model under the leadership of an extremely impressive uh, CEO who's got who's got a great track record of provenance in uh, in, in, in the industry. Mm. And just on that one, David, as we sort of draw to a close, if people want to actually sign up to growth co- uh, company investor, how do they do that? How is it best to contact you or? Is it basically just going yeah? To well, the they website? can they can they can either just send me an email at uh, editor at growthcompany.co.uk. Okay. The website though is growthcompany.co.uk. Uh, you can download a, a sample a sample copy um, and you can sign up uh, sign up to the website there. You can take out a monthly subscription, which allows you to sort of suck it and see, as it were, uh, or an annual. Uh, but that's uh, that's where you'll find me. Brilliant. What about you, Jack? And if people want to sort of go to, uh, I mean, I actually do use. Socopedia and North, and I think it's terrific as well. So, uh, where, where's the best people to contact if you want to sort of like uh, follow your yours and Paul Scott scribblings? Hmm. So the best way is is to just go to type in Stockopedia. You can take out a, a two week trial if you just want to check it out, and then me and Paul are, are pretty much up there every day writing the the small cap report, and uh, we write some other bits and bobs alongside it, checking out. Uh, more freewheeling opportunities. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I, I used to subscribe before I joined the company to work for it. I think there's a, a great community on there and it's a really great place if, if you're looking for, yeah, a sense of community and good insights from other private investors. Mm. 
Brilliant. Okay, well, thanks very much, gents, for some unbelievably good ideas for people to sort of like uh, put the slide rule over for 2022. So uh, I know it's taken a bit of time, but that's a terrific uh, bunch of really good value opportunities and also sort of growth and interesting recovery stocks as well. So uh, thanks very much for your time, guys. Thanks, Paul. Have a good Christmas. Thank you. you too. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs> Cheers.